I have become in the past week uh, increasingly, um, some people might call paranoid, but I've become rather spooked out by what's happened in the past uh, week. Uh, a few months ago, we had a discussion on the Iraq war 20 years on, and someone in the chat, I think, said, why don't you do a discussion on Dr. David Kelly's death? Um, I looked up when that was, and it's uh, it's the 17th of July. It was 17th of July, 2003. And I put in my diary, let's do discussion on Dr. David Kelly's death on the 16th of July, the day before. Um, and, you know, see how interesting that is, what, what that's about. I had no opinion on Dr. David Kelly's death. I, I know it, it seemed suspicious that the person who had all the information on weapons of uh, mass destruction in Iraq happened to die at the point when he could have revealed something. I found that rather coincidental, but I never had any suspicions of anything. I didn't really know the detail of it. Um, and then I looked in my diary, oh, okay, we've got to prepare this show for Dr. David Kelly's death. So I went up to Harrow Down Hill, which is not too far from where I live, to look at, um, to get a feel for the site where he actually died. Um, and I walked up there and I got really spooked out. It was very, very strange. I felt um, someone came up behind me on a on a bike, on a push bike, and he said to me, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm just trying to look at this place. And he said, um, I, I used to know Dr. Kelly. Um, he said that we don't, a lot of people don't think he, he did commit suicide here, um, but also said that Dr. David Kelly's family uh, don't want an investigation into it. Um, which is, seems to have been the point that has made most people stop thinking about this issue or talking about it. But there was one man that I got in touch with who has been campaigning for an investigation in Dr. David Kelly's death for the past 20 years. A remarkable uh, man, a former medical, uh, a, 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 a top medic, medic who could not see any sense in how he died uh, I tried to hold a Zoom conversation uh, interview with him uh, on Friday. Uh, I have sent this out, but I'll just show a, a, a short version of what happened on this Zoom call with him on Friday. One. He's, he's still there. As specialist medical professionals, we do not consider the evidence given at the Hutton inquiry has demonstrated that Dr. David Kelly committed suicide. Dr. Can Nicholas you hear Hunt me, Crispin? I can, yeah. Can you hear me? I can. Can, can you hear me? Oh, hold on. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, David? Can, can you hear me, Crispin? Yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello. Hello, Crispin. I've had no audio for the last minute. You can't hear me at all? No, for the last minute. It's been buggered uh, always round. What? I can, so I can hear you. You can. But you can hear me on the on the computer, can you? Well, yeah. I can't hear you. You're muted from, from my make this end. Uh, I'm not muted on here. No, well... Your pictures speaking, come back I'm now. I'm speaking on the phone now, and I cannot hear one word from you. Right. As, as I say, you put this letter into The Guardian in 2004. Can you tell me and everyone else um, why you thought it was suspicious 
um, Dr. Kelly's death. And also, can you tell us how you got into a, a group of, of, of medical people who, who thought the same thing? Can you tell us how that came about, that the medical group as, assembled to write that letter? I cannot remember my initial response to the... Um, the Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Hold on. They've taken the audio off your Zoom now. They've taken the audio off your Zoom. Yeah, so I, even though you're supposed to have an audio. Hold on. No, 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 no. I can't record, I can't record that. Um, try talking into the Zoom. Yeah, there you go. Uh, it, it, I, yeah, people might think I'm paranoid, but um, I've done Zooms for a long time. And uh, if someone's muted, they're muted. If they're unmuted, they're, they're unmuted. The, the, the fact that his picture kept going, and this is another part of that that I didn't show on that clip, his picture kept going black, black, not um, with his name on it. I uh, just, it really um, was very strange. And uh, the other thing that I have to say is that when I had phoned him up, um, the call was ridiculously bad quality. And he has said to me that he suspects he's being, um, his phone is being tapped. Um, so for me, the Dr. David Kelly issue became a little bit more suspicious as the as, as I'm trying to speak to someone who wants to challenge the verdict that he committed suicide and they seem to be uh, being messed around with. So I wanted to find out more about that. So what I did was I phoned him up um, on a separate occasion uh, with a different number and I managed to record that onto another phone and I've got this interview of him here. I'm just going to play it to you. Uh, it might it, it sheds some light on the death of uh, Dr. David Kelly, as well as what's happened to people who have been looking into it somewhat suspiciously. Some of the stuff's quite alarming. And that's why I'm also very spooked out. Um, I've left this for the end of the show, just in case um, anything happens. Here we go. Now, David, we just had a very strange um, Zoom call where your picture cut out, my audio cut out, your audio cut out. I've never experienced that before, ever. I've done lots of Zoom calls. I know when things are not right. And I know that the Kelly case is very high voltage. Uh, if there was an inquest, proper inquest, uh, which would last about six weeks on Dr. Kelly, with um, not, in the Hutton inquiry, half of one day was spent in 21 days of hearings on the forensic element. The forensic element should have taken two or three days at least, and should cross-examination should have been um, um, available. Well, it would be available in an inquest. It was excluded in the ad hoc inquiry, the Hutton inquiry, um, they couldn't call witnesses, the subpoena witnesses. There was no jury, they, no cross-examination. And there was, some, there was some other absence as well. It was an ad hoc inquiry. It had no legal force whatsoever. And people regarded as a whitewash, but the BBC et al. regarded it as the truth. So your your background on, on the David Kelly um, death was that you wrote... Uh, with a number of other medical people, a letter to say that you didn't think that the the verdict of suicide was satisfactory. Um, is that is that the beginning of your journey in a it sense? Wasn't, actually, um, I probably I did notice his death. I can't remember my reaction. I imagine that I was sceptical um, about the inverted commas suicide. I can't remember that. But I obviously thought about it later. And I then was became aware of the Hutton inquiry, which was started sitting extraordinarily 
three weeks after his death, uh, was coming out with a, with a verdict, which the, in fact, Hunt, the pathologist, had given, uh, which I did not, could not agree with as a surgeon having dealt with blood vessels and also having seen some people who try who thrash their wrists, in fact, in a, most often a cry for help. But I wrote a letter to the Morning Star on the 16th of December, thereabouts, of 2003. Um, it's on my website. It's quite a short letter. I knew the Morning Star because it printed the truth, and I knew the editor then, John Haylett. He was a very decent and good man who I met on a march, probably against the Iraq War. But um, uh, I wrote this letter, and the essence of it is that I could not accept that um, he, this man had died of exsanguination, that is, of excessive blood loss, due to the cutting of two arteries in his wrist. In fact, it was one artery I later discovered, the ulnar artery, but even then that doesn't alter my, my opinion. They are, as I said, this sound bite is stuck. They are of matchstick thickness, i.e. about three mil millimeters in width. And um, we have wonderful mechanisms for shutting down blood vessels when there is, when they're bleeding. And so I said that I couldn't accept that. And I also went on to say that um, given his background, he chose the most, um, uh, most uncertain method of suicide. Um, uh, that is a man who'd spent nine years ahead of Port and Down, where they had done lots of uh, non-recovery experiments on poor animals, sheep, primates, Adel, in our so-called defense uh, against biological weapons and chemical weapons, that he would know all about how, how things died. In other words, another beside of mine, he knew about the biology of death. So he chose the most uncertain method, uh, slitting his wrist, he would have known that wouldn't kill him anyway, uh, taking, it is said, 29 coproximal tablets, with only one remaining in one of the three packs in his um, uh, bar barber jacket, and... Um, uh, then that those were the main causes of death. The pills were, were the secondary cause, and then he added um, that he had coronary artery uh, atherosclerosis. Well, a lot of men of 60 plus have some coronary disease. That's a fact. Particularly a man like him who'd led a fairly stressful life. So that was my letter, and I ended it with saying that I've been hesitant to write in this way because I did not want to cause distress to the family. But I added that the elite, so-called, running our country were not so worried about um, distress for the family. Given that his name had been put into the public domain, I think in the direction of Mr. Hoon and possibly Blair, when in fact a man who had such access, he had top CIA and top uh, MI6 clearance, such, uh, the identity of, those, of such people is always kept secret, but they made damn sure that his name was, in fact, publicized. Uh, journalists had to ring in to the MOD, I think it was, and if they gave the right name, i.e. Kelly, then it was confirmed that, that, was the, that they were correct, and that's what it then caused the uh, media storm um, surrounding this poor man. Right. Get the picture. Yeah. I wrote then on December the 16th, and then uh, Dr. David, Dr. Stephen Frost, a uh, medical colleague, and Rowena Thursby, who were both looking into this death uh, and were getting other expert opinions, actually. But I was really one of three to start with, I suppose. And that Christmas, uh, I, was en I ended up writing and telephoning a great deal to these two men two people, I should say, and um, in the process, I ended up with an ap apocalypsis. I've had, in fact, three blow-ups of uh, teeth sepsis, all caused by the um, excess stress of long hours and uh, trying to keep up to deadlines. So I've had my own little um, sufferings, but I remain very fit in my 84th year, Crispin, and I am not giving up on Kelly or on Palestine, or on our NHS. Right. So we're dealing with uh, what I call elemental evil. We're dealing with the domination of evil state power as 
symbolized by the imprisonment and the torture of Julian Assange, who in the, who in the Commons is standing up for him at the moment, just a few MPs. Yeah. So, that, Christine, so what, what, I'm, what I'm interested in is, is um, you've, you've, I mean, what happened with us on that Zoom interview um, this morning, but also I've tried to phone you up before and your phone line is really bad and, and you can hardly hear me. Yes. Um, has this had, answer. can I just, uh, can I just ask you, I mean, if this has been, how long do you think your phone and your communications have been kind of tampered with in any way? I know that I've been under surveillance for a long time, even before I got involved with Kelly. And I suspect that it's probably because I was vocal and strong in opposition to Thatcher's internal market when I was serving as an orthopedic and trauma surgeon in the health service. And I saw what was happening to our service and I knew that that internal market in 1988, which Thatcher and her inner cabinet were promoting. Uh, I forget the title now of uh, that particular move, but I knew that was the first stroke, first obvious stroke of the against the health service. I spoke against it, and there is evidence that I was a bit under surveillance from that, from some time like that. And I also know that I was targeted at Torbay Hospital there's no question about this, because I was taught to be honest, that I was taught that to lie is a carnal sin, and I spoke up for the service to be as efficient and as kind as possible, and that didn't fit with some elements in Torbay. And I can add this, Crispin, I'm pretty sure that Torbay was one of the test beds for some of the vile policies which undermined our health service. Um, now back back to the um, Dr. David Kelly um, situation. Um, now, the the family of Dr. David Kelly, it said they they don't want um, any investigation. That they they accept the suicide uh, verdict, and that seems to be the argument that's used to stop any more conversation on this. I mean, I spoke to um, Claire Short, yeah. and she said. Uh, on that question, she said, well, the, the, the family are happy with the verdict as it is. Um, I don't think much of Claire Shaw, to be blunt. Well, what, what do you, what, what's your response to that? I mean, is, is that a viable argument, that the family are, 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 are happy with the verdict? There's two things, though, Brisbane. The first is that you do not take the opinion of, uh, of family members, especially in the cases of unnatural death. Because, as you well know, look at poisoning, slow poisoning by a wife, say, of a husband or vice versa. You're not going to ask <laughs> the person who's been possibly involved in the slow death of someone what their opinion is, whether there should be an inquest or not. So that's the first thing, that there may be interested parties, the family. The second thing is this, is that the death of Dr. Kelly, a tableau was set up which leaves you uncertain. I'm fully really certain what happened. But for some people, you don't know whether it was assassination or whether it was suicide. The evidence for assassination is, in this case, overwhelming, but an inquest would have to reveal it. That's why you want an inquest. You want the law to apply, be applied to it. But um, that what has been done here, that the possibility of assassination of people who speak out has been dangled, so it's a threat. And I can bet your bottom dollar that Mrs. Kelly and her children, her three daughters, that they do fear the possibility that something will happen to them should they, in fact, say, look, we want an inquest on our dad or on my, on my wife or my late husband. Do you understand me? Right. So that is, it's dangled this, I'm quite certain, pretty certain that it's been designed partly for that. It's partly a threat. What happened to Kelly is a threat. Right. Not to speak up. And in America, particularly, and that, that really is a fascist. Yes, wonderful people there speaking up, thank God. 
But when you think that JFK, you think of Martin Luther King and the dozens of others who've in fact been, who've been speaking against the inverted commas narrative, who've ended up, you know, having fallen off a bridge into the, into the um, Hudson or something like that. The numbers are massive, actually, and there's some here. And I've already told you that, in fact, two lay people who were both wonderful, one was a wonderful investigator, Brian Spencer, he had an unusual death in, in Derford Hospital, just west of here. And I, we tried, Frost and I, to get an inquest on him, blocked. And another man called Gerard Jonas, who lived very close to where Kelly lived, uh, he was a um, commercial mechanic, had a small business, and Gerard was a man who wanted, he didn't like to see our country corrupt. He opposed the Afghan war, for instance, as I did, and he was always speaking up for the truth, and he really went on for the Kelly thing. But I think in a measured way, uh, he was very vocal. He um, bugged the, um, or bugged, he was on often to the uh, coroner in Oxford, um, to forget his name for a moment, but uh, he ended up uh, having killed himself supposedly on the railway line between Oxford and Reading. And I was very disturbed about, I had over 300 emails I see, in fact, to and from Gerard. I respected him. He came here once uh, on his way to pick up an engine down in Penzance. And he was an honest man, unusual man, but he could not accept that Kelly's death should not be investigated properly with an inquest. And he ended up with his head on the line. We could discuss that. But I, I still have grave doubts about whether that was his intention. His daughter had something to say about that. I, it's all on, my, all on my website. I mean, can I, my, can I just say about the Kelly one again? I mean, because uh, in your, in, on your website that you, you've that you've put so much detail onto. Um, you, you do talk about Kelly, and this is known to other people, obviously, as well. It's not just your information. But Kelly was uh, in contact with his daughter that day to say that there was a a, a foal, was it, uh, that was... He, he, read, he read 82 emails. This is... This is on the day he supposedly killed himself. On the, well, on the day, on the, in the 24 hours following, he wrote on that morning... On the Tuesday, he was interrogated by the Foreign Affairs Committee, and it's always um, put forward that he was put under great stress. He was a pretty resilient man, actually, and I think essentially a very honest man, too. I think he was a, de I think he was a moral man, as I said before. But he, one of the emails, two emails stand out, and they were actually published in the Hutton Inquiry. But he wrote to his daughter, Rachel, who lives in Oxford or close to Oxford, very fond of her. And he said he wanted to go out the next day, the Friday, to show her a, um, a mare in a paddock down the village who'd had a foal very recently. Now, this was, a, this was a, an email of affection and of love of the natural world, of, of another animal species. And that's very important. This is not, now that might be an emotional response to forced suicide. I realize that. But he also wrote to colleagues saying that he'd been booked to fly to Iraq nine days later by the MOD or by the Foreign Office, I forget which. And uh, he was looking forward to that. So, yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't sound like um, someone who's about to commit suicide or, or kill himself. Um... What, um... Well, it would be, to be frank, you see, he would be writing 82, 82 emails. Uh, I, at one point, at one point or another, might have contemplated suicide when I was very depressed in 1992. But you don't write emails in, those, in that state of mind. You don't even have the concentration to sit down and type at a keyboard, to be frank about it. Yeah. You are, your mind is in a whirl. You feel you have no self-esteem. Um, that's one thing. There's all sorts of reasons for suicide apart from getting back to other people. But um, there's nothing to suggest in those emails that he sent that day that he was contemplating his, his death by his own hand.
And and there's no suicide note either, which is also something you would expect from no, someone. No, no. Now, his mother took her life, and that's been emphasised a bit, you know. And another thing which, in fact, has been... Um, was introduced by that Dandel Man Mangold, the, you know, reported to the BBC, his wife, the marriage was unhappy, she was a bit crabby, she had chronic arthritis. Um, that, you know, there's been... And you see... The whole thing, the police were putting round an implication of fluid suicide within three hours of the body being found before it was identified, before it was even known as Dr. Kelly. So the police were pushing it. And the police concealed, as you know, a lot of evidence. Like, for instance, there was no fingerprints on the knife, that is, the pruning knife he kept uh, habitually in his um, jacket. There's all... There's a a catalogue of omissions and lies. The whole thing is um, a sham. And the truth is setting us free. I'm quite hopeful, actually, Crispin. I'm very hopeful that having tried Russia Today and Channel 4 to be interviewed at the anniversary, 20th anniversary of uh, Kelly's unnatural death and our plea for an inquest, that have had no response from RT or from Channel 4. But I've had a response from you, and I'm grateful for that, and I find that quite inspiring. Uh, well, there, there, there's the interview with uh, Dr. David Alpin. Some of that is very alarming to me. I don't know what, what to think if people are being um, assassinated um, in this way. I mean, where, where, where are we? in this uh, democracy and also i have to I, I mean i don't want to get people thinking about conspiracy theories and all that it's such a taboo word to conspiracy theorists but um no one's talking about this no one is talking about it. mps aren't talking about it so many people are suspicious about the death of dr david kelly but no mps are bringing it up um why is are people really scared of this? I mean, I'm spooked by it, but I'm telling you all this to because I think, well, if they're going to bump me off, then you can kind of know that it's something's happened. <laughs>